All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our first Distinguished Cybersecurity Lecture this semester. Uh, today, we're going to have Professor Winky Lee uh, to talk about AI and security. Uh, Professor Lee is the John P. Amley Junior Chair in the School of Computer Science in the College of Computing at Georgia Tech. Uh, he's also the Executive Director of the Institute for Information Security and Privacy. Uh, his research expertise includes system and labor security, botnet detection and attribution, malware analysis, virtual machine monitoring, mobile system security, detection and mitigation of information manipulation on the internet. He often leads large projects funded by NSF, DOD, DHS, and the private industry. A significant discovery from his research group have been transferred to industry, uh, such as uh, Dambala Incorporation, co-founded by Professor Lee in 2006. Uh, Professor Lee is one of the most prolific and influential security researchers in the world. He has published several dozen often cited research papers at top conferences, such as ACMCCS, Using Security, Oakland, and NDSS. Uh, Professor Lee has received many awards and honors, uh, such as being elected a uh, fellow of both ACM and uh, IEEE, uh, the ACM SIGSAC Outstanding Innovation Award, the Internet Defense Prize, and the Career Award, and Best Paper, Best Paper Awards from top conferences such as Oakland and KDD. Uh, today, Professor Lee is going to give us a lecture entitled Machine Learning and Security, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Lee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Zhuxiang. Yeah, I've known uh, Zhuxiang for a long time, so it's really an honor to be invited um, to give a talk at Ohio State. Uh, I think you guys are pretty lucky to uh, to uh, convince him to join you guys uh, to begin with. Okay, so today I'm going to um, to share my uh, perspectives um, on machine learning and security. Right. So oh, let me see here. All right. So I'm going to just. Uh, you know, first go over some of the lessons they've learned. I mean, this is a long history of work uh, in applying machine learning to cybersecurity. And of course, people are in general understand uh, why are we you know, applying machine learning for security because it has uh, you know, uh, a lot of benefits. But, but then I'm going to turn our attention to what the potential problems, in particular, how attackers can abuse machine learning or use machine learning to help, uh, help their um, help the um, attacks, and then talk about some of the challenges, I think the long-term challenges that we should start uh, working on. Okay, so let's focus on, you know, what's good. I mean, there's a so relatively, um, I think everybody agrees. Uh, so if you look at the Google trend, for example, uh, there's a lot of uh, searches, I mean, the last couple of years, uh, you know, uh, looking, looking, looking at what it means, um, by deep learning and then machine learning and then also artificial intelligence. So that so you see a you know huge uptake in particular after you know around I think the big trend started you know 2000 you know 16 17 I think that's when uh, deep learning really uh, started to uh, take off and then it comes down a little bit now because I think people are starting to um, realize some of the limitations and some of those limitations we're going to uh, discuss today as well. So that's in general the you know uh, talking about how society is reacting to machine learning and um, and artificial intelligence. Now, if you want to if you want to focus on um, uh, cybersecurity, I think some of you, in particular, if you are a recent students, uh, new students, you may think that this is relatively uh, a new uh, new uh, phenomenon. That's actually not true. Uh, in fact. In fact, um, if you think about uh, when people started, I would say in the 80s, like even early 80s, researchers were started looking at uh, how, how we can use statistical, uh, statistical reasoning or analysis on audit data, right? And then from there, um, Doris Denning, I think in the late 1980s, started uh, the concept of anomaly um, detection and so on. And then in the starting uh, 1990s, there a lot of work in applying data mining or, or machine learning actually to our security. And then, you know, fast forward to 2000, when we have big data, you know, a lot of data available, a lot of compute power available. Um, researchers actually started to look at what the attacker could do to evade or poison uh, machine learning. Okay, so, so the whole concept of a sorry machine learning 
of course, is relatively new term. But adversarial attacks using a uh, machine learning actually is something that uh, we have studied since the early uh, 2000s. And then fast forward, you know, again to the more recent years, uh, we see a lot of uh, deep learning um, uh, um, work. And, uh, and of course, you have seen that deep learning can be applied to many uh, interesting areas. But then we also see that some of the new attacks come out like deep fake and so on. So, so in summary, you know, actually we have a long history of uh, applying machine learning to uh, cybersecurity. And I, I, I list some of the reference work here. Now, um, just give you some quick example to warm up, right? So, so this work that I, I did when I was doing my um, PhD uh, thesis. So you can think about uh, if you want to apply machine learning to learn some patterns to detect uh, network intrusions, the, you know, uh, you know, we know that in machine learning, you want to create label data, right? And so essentially you have defined some features or attributes of the records. So in this case, you know, I, def I define number of attributes for each connection uh, record, right? You know, so, so let's say how many, you know, how many connection to, you know, within time window, how, how many different uh, 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 port it, it targeted, what kind of errors and so on. And then you, create, you know, of course, uh, you, if you're ground truth, you put labels such as whether this connection is legitimate, was part of attack and so on. And then you can learn, you know, you can apply machine learning uh, algorithm. In this case, I, I applied uh, inductive rule learner to learn a, a rule like this, such as, okay, if if this this product of the connection is, uh, is uh, uh, um, uh, ICMP echo request, and uh, you're more than certain counts, then it's a similar for attack, you know. And if it's basically scanning, you know, uh, to to um, different uh, 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 connections, then you may have a Satan attack, which is basically a scanning attack. So, so if you look at a rule like this, although it's produced by a machine learning process, at least the humans, right, the uh, can be the system admin or or whatever the software engineer um, who's responsible for uh, updating the secure product, they can look at this um, output. And make sense. Understand why, you know. Understand what this pattern is talking about. And in fact, the human can actually go in there and and and, and update some of these uh, values uh, if uh, if the human thinks that his expert expert knowledge is more important or more useful. Okay. So 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 really, you know, like I said, the lesson that we learned. I mean, the biggest lesson I learned uh, that at least um, I thought that was the most important one is that you know the domain experts or people who are going to use the output of the, of the machine learning process should be able to understand what the model is, is, uh, is doing. And then also be able to update or, or, mod, or revise the model uh, if the experts think that the model is not correct. Okay, that's very important. You cannot just, you know, I'm against the practice of just deploying something out of you know, machine learning, just think about it, it's a black box as applied the output of a black box. That seems to me, that's not a responsible way of um, using machine learning. And then really, at least uh, uh, at the time that when I was doing my thesis in the, you know, um, late 1990s, I, I would say this statement is true up until deep learning really took off in uh, after 2015, in a sense that, you know, if you can create some very good features and you have a very good data. You actually don't need very fancy algorithms. In fact, some of the machine learning people would tell me that either use the simplest algorithm uh, that that would normally uh, work very well. Meaning that really, if if the features are good, any algorithm would would do reasonably well. Okay, and then of course the accuracy. So this actually goes deeper into the machine learning uh, algorithm. Is that most of the the algorithms are based on some statistics. And when you talk about statistics, it's based on the data that you have, right? Basically, a lot of assumptions that you make on the data, meaning that the train, you, you want the test data and the training data have, you know, would share some statistical properties, including certain distribution and so on. Otherwise, you can learn something, you, you can learn a model using the, using the training data, but if the test data have th completely different characteristics, it's not going to work well, okay? And now, of course, people talk about you know, so the model have, have biases and so on. I would say that that's not necessarily something, uh, sorry. And it's not something that uh, uh, the uh, domain expert 
um, intended the model to be biased just because the training data was not uh, was not the selected uh, properly. Or sometimes there's all sorts of limitation in terms of what data you can use. Okay, so now um, that's uh, the up to uh, uh, late 1990s. I was using an example, and then and then go from that point on. Uh, we see that there are more acceptance of using machine learning uh, in security, right? And of course, you can see many papers. But the main reason, the main driving force uh, behind it is that people starting to see the the very um, you know uh, important needs to analyze a huge amount of data, right? Including alerts from security sensors, all kind of logs, uh, and so on, all the logs and so on. And then people also realize that with machine learning, you essentially at least you're automating data analysis. Okay, and so for example, you can correlate different kinds of uh, alerts and patterns, or you can actually extract something interesting from data to take a look to see whether you should update your domain knowledge. Or at least you could say, hey, I already have some very strong domain knowledge, but at least you can use some, some machine learning or statistical tools to actually validate whether your intuition is correct from the data, from, from what you can see in the data. So, so there's a lot of benefits. And uh, in fact, if you look uh, or talk about, if you look at the white papers of, of uh, the major security vendors, they all say that they use uh, machine learning uh, in the products and services. Now, how how much they're using it, you know, it's up to you to to figure it out. But they all say the the fact that they all say they use machine learning means that they all understand machine learning is very useful and it's very important. And of course. You know, most researchers have embraced machine learning and you see so many papers uh, 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 on using machine learning uh, to um, automate various kinds of security analysis. Now, um, what's the current, you know, current hardest uh, trend or technology in machine learning? And of course, that's uh, deep learning, right? So that's actually, uh, all, you know, people think of it as an accident, but it's not quite. One is we are in it age of big data, we have just a lot, a lot of data, right? I mean, this, I mean, it's almost like we are in a, a positive uh, a feedback loop, right? The more, the more data we have, the more models we build, you know, and then deploy them more, and then we want more data. So you basically keep collecting more data, deploying more uh, system or sensors to, to collect data and so on. And then, and then of course, you know, we increasingly have more and more powerful computers, you know, uh, from cloud to, to um, to some of these uh, big corporations having their own uh, uh, super duper uh, computing systems. So that, you know, combining big data and, uh, and uh, very powerful compute power, then you now have uh, deep learning, right? Now, from an algorithmic point of view, you know, you can think about deep learning as a multi layers of neural nets, kind of, you know, the approximation. Essentially, it's a multiple layers of data transformation that you transfer some raw data, you know, some intermediate representation and eventually you, you have uh, you have the final um, final uh, model or, 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 or prediction. Now, one thing that deep learning would say is that you know with deep learning you don't have to do any feature engineering. I I kind of think that's an incorrect statement. Um, you know you, you you need to always format your data properly and filter out some of the junk before you apply deep learning. Now, of course, the amount of of feature engineering is very, very uh, different from the from the um, from the days of the nineteen nineties when we have the when we apply classical machine learning algorithms, right? Uh, so there, you really have to encode a lot of domain knowledge into the features. And deep learning is supposed to uh, with deep learning, you you don't have to do that much of um, feature engineering. But is it zero? Uh, I I. I, I don't believe so. So so anyway, so so th so this is a, a matter of a debate, but I'm going to get back uh, uh, to the to this point a little bit later. Okay, uh, and now of course you know with deep deep learning, one of the one of the um, um, one of the um, shortcomings people are pointed to is that you know sometimes we, we find some very easy attacks to deep learning models. And and then and then people, you know, and in particular when you don't have very good feature engineering, you don't even know what it does, and so it's, it's sometimes it's hard actually 
you know, uh, reason about uh, its robustness and completeness, right? But if you ask the hardcore deep learning people, they say, ah, oh, so what? You know, and any mistake we identify, we just, you know, the chain model using some, some, of, the, some of the data that cause, uh, cause the error, or we create some synthetic data. And, and, and their point of view is that the more data you provide to the deep learning process, the more complete a model uh, you can produce. Okay, so first, first of all, whether that's true or not, it's, it's, it's remain to be seen. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of uh, uh, improvement in, uh, in the algorithm that they have, they have to put in. Second of all is that you would never know when it's efficient. You cannot theoretically say, oh, by the amount of data that I put in, I guarantee, you know, I have learned a complete uh, model. There's no such thing that you can prove their model is so quote unquote complete. So there's always shortcomings uh, like any other uh, algorithm. Now, of course, like I said, you know, deep learning has been used in many interesting uh, applications, right? Most, uh, I think most successful ones will be image and face recognition and so on. Um, so, so deep learning has been uh, used in, um, in, in security, uh, of course. Uh, in fact, you see a lot of um, um, interesting or new uh, <laughs> work, for example, um, you know, we, we can, you know, for the from the defense point of view, we can actually, you know, use multimodal data to um, to do continuous authentication, uh, meaning that not just single factor, but multiple multiple factors and multiple uh, dimension of uh, of human behavior, for example. And then you also for attack attribution in extract, you know, you know, multiple sometimes subtle. Uh, um, uh, um, Signals, so right? For example, you say you want to do malware authors, you, you look at you know not just the coding but also the comments and and uh, where it's where it's being job is being used and so on. So the multiple uh, uh, sources of um, uh, uh, data that you can actually uh, analyze and then correlate the discoveries and so on and so forth, right? So meaning that you know machine learning really or deep learning really help us uh, do deeper and more complete work when we try to. Um, try to do security um, and uh, security analytics. Now, um, so, so to summarize, you know, I mean, I think everybody would agree that, you know, it, it's a good thing that uh, we finally realize. I mean, I think, and to be honest, when I finished my thesis, there was still a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, doubts in the community in terms of why are you using machine learning for security? So I'm very glad that, you know, after, 10, 15 years, and particularly in the last couple of years, everybody say yes, okay, yeah, machine learning is a good thing. Um, so I, I, I don't hold it, I don't hold it against anybody that didn't realize that uh, um, earlier, right? Just because you know, I think nowadays it's so obvious that we need automatic analysis, right? Um, we need to automate uh, security uh, uh, analytics because there's so much data that we have to deal with every day. Now we're going to next. Uh, go into some of the uh, shortcomings or potential or uh, actually uh, uh, realistic um, uh, problems uh, that the attacker, sorry, uh, keep, uh, the attackers uh, would abuse machine learning, right? So the point here is that just because we are now using machine learning um, very widely, doesn't mean that the shortcomings will just go away automatically. In fact, I would argue that the shortcomings actually would get uh, magnified. Now, so what are we talking about? So we're going to talk about you know uh, a few examples. Basically, you can put them into two kind of categories. One is that what the attackers would do to automate and make the attacks more powerful, right? So I mean, obviously, you know, machine learning is all about automation, automating a lot of data uh, analytics and uh, creating uh, models. And the attacker can do the same thing. They can basically automatically construct you know malware and attacks and so on. Um, and, and, and you say, look, I mean, so what? Uh, we know that the machine learning model can be abused or has shortcomings. We know that in very uh, uh, various kind of applications, but you, you have to think about the security by definition, we have a high bar, okay? Be because um, because uh, security is, is about the safety of the system, for example, right? And then the high bar means that we have to hold it at a high standard, higher standard, we also have to uh, recognize that the attacker, they're out there, the attackers are out there to actually try to defeat 
uh, our defense, uh, our, our defenses, right? Even though our defense system is uh, using machine learning, so what? You cannot just assume that the attacker will not use machine learning. In fact, you should always assume that the attacker will use machine learning and their goal is to defeat you, okay? So that's a much higher bar than other application that you could argue is that's, that's not as critical, okay? Um, now, I mean, like I said, the attackers will use, use, use machine learning to automate uh, their attacks, not just in the construction and transformation uh, uh, part, but also they can they may be able to um, uh, devise a new uh, new uh, methods, new attack methods uh, uh, on the fly, basically based on what the defense mechanisms um, are, are, are looking at, right? So they may they may choose to you know let's say uh, target their attack at another part of the network, you know, to evade, um, to evade the um, defenses, right? So that's one aspect. Another aspect is that the machine learning algorithm would also, I mean, sorry, the, the attackers may actually, you know, um, study the machine learning uh, process and then try to uh, mislead the training, uh, the machine learning process to learn something uh, uh, not useful. For example, that's what I call about the the uh, adversarial learning, meaning that they can pollute the training data. Uh, and, and, and so, so if you're not careful, we end up learning the wrong model. Okay. That will completely miss the attack. And, and uh, another kind of uh, attack on the machine learning uh, process is called a model evasion, meaning that the attacker can actually, you know, study a deployed uh, machine learning system and then find it's a, uh, find the, uh, find and it's, uh, uh, figure out its, its, its decision trees and also then figure out a way to, to make the attack, you know, uh, 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 evade the model because uh, once it knows the decision boundary, it can morph the attack to make the attack look like normal while still uh, continue to carry out the, the attacking steps. So I'll give you a few quick, uh, quick examples here, right? So, so think about what attackers can, can use machine learning to, um, to make their uh, malware uh, uh, more powerful, right? So they, for example, they can actually learn the triggering condition. They can actually be very stealth in, in, in terms of how they do the, how to do spyware, right? Um, meaning that they they can actually, you know, key log using not just the keystroke, but also the side, analyzing the, 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 the your, your, your motion, the type, the, 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 the type is the motion and, and sound and so on. And, and the uh, um, um, you know the attacker can use machine learning to learn the environment and also uh, sometimes the the uh, user's behavior in order to actually make the attack much more accurate. Okay, and then um, and then and then the, the attacker can also use their machine learning uh, can also use machine learning algorithm to make their attack much harder to catch, right? So, so for example, you know, they, they can actually, um, you know, make the uh, malware to evade um, uh, detection. For example, can command control, uh, uh, the com command control aspect of, you know, botnets or all these kind of uh, online, online uh, cyber attacks or, or, or frauds is very critical, right? So, so command control means that the, uh, the infected host can connect to a server and get updated commands and even updated malware and so on. So obviously, if you are in the network, um, uh, uh, you if you are you are putting a network a defense system, you're going to watch some of these uh, you know uh, incoming and outgoing traffic to detect you know command possible command control traffic, and the attacker actually can learn what the normal you know, web traffic will look like in your organization. And then actually, you know, from that point on, make their, make their, um, um, make their command control traffic look similar to the normal uh, command, uh, uh, normal web traffic. So that's an example of uh, try to detect, uh, try to evade detection based on your, your baseline uh, normal uh, activities. And similarly in social engineering, right? People talk about why is phishing so hard to actually prevent? Well, because the attacker actually has spent a lot of time learning the target or learning what would trigger the target to react. 
And so, you know, different target may get different kind of, for example, phishing email, you know, meaning that they're different, different, they word it differently or being sent to different images and so on. So, so all of these actually require some machine learning to actually learn and profiling, uh, creating profiles of targets and so on. So there's a lot of, a lot of these um, uh, more advanced attacks are essentially enabled by machine learning. Okay. Again, this summarizes a big learning the environment, learning the learning the target by right? creating profiles. And uh, for, for deep fake, uh, uh, you know, for deep learning for a while, people say, oh, there's deep fake. I mean, you will see some uh, uh, examples of deep fake attacks on, you know, different videos and audios look fun, but actually there are deep fake attacks that are actually not for fun, actually for profit, right? So here's the example on the, on your left showing that, you know, people actually can um, use a deep fake to uh, impersonate certain, um, you know, certain important, certain important person or some person with, I don't know, uh, with, uh, with means, then, you know, they can actually uh, extort money. So it's not fun. And also you also see that on the right hand side, there's some other um, deep fake attacks that actually try to, um, you know, create misinformation or, or also disrupt some of the uh, um, uh, uh, healthcare operation. That's actually pretty uh, dangerous as well. Okay, so, so I would say that, you know, uh, so, so the trend is that this will continue, meaning that the attackers will continue to use machine learning. And uh, they, they're using it not just for, you know, to discover vulnerabilities and, and creating new models and new way to attack, but also, and, and, and they will continue this trend and make it increasingly uh, dynamic uh, and, and, and automated, right? And, and the thing is that, you know, one thing about the attacking uh, community is that they seem to seem to be able to seem to be willing to share uh, their tool and make them very easy to use. So you you see that sometimes they attack uh, uh, techniques can get accelerated pretty quickly because they are sharing some of these uh, new tools that they develop. Um, so just, just to summarize, you know, you know, I would say that the machine learning powered attack and malware are just inevitable. They will all you know they will just become more and they become, you know, uh, uh, not only uh, uh, more widely, um, uh, 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 they will spread more widely, but also will become more powerful, right? Just use one example here about, you know, uh, let's say uh, botnets, right? So, so, so let's say, you know, uh, botnets, you know, obviously they need to do some covert communication with their servers, but also even the attacks, they want to make it, you know, try to stay low and low and slow. Uh, so, so previously we say that they use very so-called remote static game, meaning that the, the attacker who actually created a bot, uh, botnet, they will hard code, they will hard code the exact, they will hard code the specific methods that the uh, botnet will use to communicate, for example, use Skype. So it's very hard, hard coded. So, which means that if the defenders block Skype, then the botnet's dead. Okay. So, you know, so that's the old kind of old technique. The current, current uh, botnet, they will use what we call local static game, meaning that they will actually try to shape their traffic, right? The, we call traffic shaping to, to, make, to make the communication look like the normal traffic. Okay, so that's, that's pretty much uh, pretty uh, widely used now, the technique. Um, and, and, uh, and, and then, and then uh, uh, and so what, we, what we're going to see next, in fact, some of them are already seeing is that we, uh, they use so-called local dynamic game, meaning that the, bot, the botnet come in and uh, sometimes with a whole set of uh, possible methods or sometimes they have a machine learning algorithm that basically on the fly would develop something uh, new that, you know, uh, just in principle, as long as you can communicate to outside uh, server, it doesn't really uh, uh, have to be uh, with a specific um, um, method, for example, right? You know they can they can just depending on depending on what's available, they may use uh, web traffic, they may use peer to peer traffic, and so on. Just depending on the, the current um, uh, current network, and or maybe current the current time of day, and so on. So meaning that nothing is set in stone. Uh, instead, the binary will actually learn uh, learn just not only the normal uh, profile of the uh, of the users of the network, but also what the defense system is doing. Okay, 
So, so, so you can see you can see that with machine learning, the attacker will use increasing level of sophistication to automate and make the attack much, uh, uh, much more uh, um, evasive. Okay, so so that's what the attacker would do uh, using machine learning um, to uh, um, to automate some of the, some of these uh, attacks and make it uh, make the attacks more evasive. Now let, let me um, just uh, uh, also touch upon what the um, attackers may do to actually um, uh, disrupt the machine learning process from the beginning. So so this is about injecting uh, noise into the training data so that the machine learning algorithm may learn a model that's not very uh, yeah, useful. So for example, this, this problem about, you know, uh, uh, learning the signature of a worm, internet worm. So the, 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 the proposed method at a time, and this is a, like, you know, 2005, six ish time, time frame, is that if we can collect traffic that we know uh, is most likely worm traffic, uh, we can then apply machine learning uh, algorithm to actually learn the signatures of, of, of the worm. Now then we say, okay, now what if the, uh, what if the attacker in the worm, um, in the worm, the malware, whenever the malware sends a worm flow, it also sends a so-called fake anonymous flow. Meaning that the, you know, this flow is basically in the boundary between normal and worm. So the purpose of that is that so that so that the, the so that when, when the classifier try to generate signature, you actually you actually being forced to to actually uh, consider in the suspicious uh, flow pool, you will actually include a fake anonymous flow, so that and because the data is not clean, uh, uh, the classifier would have too many false positive and false negative. For example, right? If the if the um, if there's a way to exclude the fake anonymous flow from the real uh, worm flow, the the classifier may have a lot of false negative. In a sense that because the fake anonymous 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 flow, we also also include a lot of legitimate patterns of the worm. See them as uh, quote unquote malicious enough. You throw them away. Then you may throw away some useful patterns. To detect the real worm, so you generate false negative. Now, if we include all of them, because those fake anonymous, anonymous flows also include some patterns, signatures that are that are actually in the normal, uh, in the legitimate uh, uh, network flows. Then, in that case, you include, include all of them. You also have then you can generate a lot of false negative. I'm oh, sorry, a false positive because you say you know as long as as long as you have this these patterns, you are you are uh, you are malicious. But in fact, those are you know. Uh, those are also uh, patterns of uh, legitimate flows. So, so the point is that with the fake anonymous flow, if you did, uh, uh, de uh, design them uh, very cleverly, then the machine learning algorithm have no have really no way of producing very good uh, classifier. It either has too many uh, false positive or false negative. So, we basically show that the attacker can actually by introducing fake anon anonymous flow can mislead. The machine learning process to produce to produce something that's not useful at all, and so you say, okay, now to deal with this problem, I just want to do a better job in validating the training data. But the thing is, how you do that, right? How do you do that? You say, well, I, I have a way to you know classify and or maybe cluster data into different clusters, so I know what are the normal ones, what are the uh, you know uh, malicious ones and, uh, and and fake ones. Well, I mean, if you can do that already. That means you already have a very good classifier. So what is the point of you know using machine learning and train yet another classifier? So that's that's a problem that that not easy to deal with. And then and then you say so so you know so so an, an, an orthogonal defense will be I want to control the data sources. Okay, so that as long as the attacker cannot control my training data set, then I think I'm good. Okay. Now uh, for example, I can use multiple sample sets, you know, cross validate them, you know, you use, you can use, let's say distributed a random sampling and so on. Uh, but on the other hand, so depending on the environment that you're in, in a network, you may be able to do that as long as the attacker does not control, let's say the whole network. 
Uh, but on the other hand, if the data source is kind of open, I, I, I mean, this is an open environment such as the internet, then you, you may not be able to actually control what the attacker would do to the input data. For example, here's a quick example of what the attacker could do, uh, you know, so so-called reputation management. So suppose you want to, you know, you know, fix your Google results so that you, you look good when people search you. So, the, so these companies can actually do this for you. They would actually hire people, you know, let's say through um, Mechanical Turks, uh, Amazon. They ask these people to go into Google, type in your name, like search for this person, and then, and then locate that particular URL that they want these people to locate. Okay, and, and what does URL say? This is a page that talks about how great you are. So let's say different users have different pages that they need to search and then look at the page. These, all these pages are, are, are manufactured by the company to manage your reputation to all say good things about you. The point is that when you hire enough people doing that, you, you're telling Google or you're providing signals to Google that when people search your name, they want to look at positive things. And then after a while, Google will put all these positive pages about you uh, in, in the top search results. And then how, to how you fix your uh, reputation. Now, to me, that's a classic you know, uh, data poisoning uh, uh, a problem. Now, but Google may not uh, uh, agree with me. So that's something that you think about, okay? So meaning that that's example of open environment. In open environment, that's how challenging it is to actually control uh, misinformation, disinformation, and so on. Meaning how do you know the user actually, you know, are really interested in positive things about you versus they are trying try to manipulate. Okay, uh, I don't want to go into politics, but you know what I mean. Okay, so another aspect of what the attacker would do to uh, disrupt the machine learning process or the model that that produced by machine learning is so-called evasion attack. So, for example, the attack the attackers can analyze the deploy model, right, and then find out the decision boundary. For example, you can send some data and see whether the IDS will reject it or not. So by doing that, you actually you're creating some chain, uh, some label data, data, right? And from there, if you know the sorry, if you know the machine learning algorithm, you already have the label data labeled by the machine learning uh, algorithm because depending on whether the that data get passed through or not, you're sending from here to here, right? If the data gets through, you know it's positive. Uh, you, you know that the, the machine learning algorithm thinks it's a, it's a legit and if get rejected, you know the machine learning algorithm recognizes that it is a, a, a attack. So you actually, as attacker here, by sending such data, you actually figure out what the machine learning algorithm is doing. You essentially create some label data. And if you know the algorithm, then you can actually learn, learn a kind of a baby, baby version of this uh, model. And then using that model as a way to test how you can morph your attack to evade, to evade the algorithm. So we did this experiment, you know, so for example, on the left, you see that without any, any blending, right? The attacker, the green one, will look very different from the normal one. So the, meaning that the attack would be detected. But once we figure out the decision boundary, okay? We can actually morph, morph the attack so that it fits the normal profile, but, but still carry out the attack uh, activities. Also that meaning that evasion attack actually is quite possible. Now, um, let me just uh, touch upon um, um, deep learning. So, so with deep learning actually is very surprising. So what the example that I gave us uh, up to this point is more or less I'm using example of a classical machine learning. Then you say, what about deep learning? I would say that for deep learning actually, you know, first of all, you know, I haven't seen too many very sophisticated examples Samples of uh, deep learning in security data yet, okay. But but I've seen a, seen a few new ones. But I have, I I will reserve my um my uh, comments maybe in some future dates. But but most of the the um the research on on the attacks on deep learning algorithms have been on some of these image data. And uh, the takeaway is that it's surprising easy. So this attack, for example, right if you if your deep learning uh, algorithm is the task is to produce a model so that when it recognizes a stop sign, it's okay, that's a stop sign. But turns out that if the attacker manipulate certain pixels, so these pixels are in a high frequency domain, meaning that they're so high, the frequency is so high in, in a sort of from a 
from a signal um, uh, a spectrum point of view, the human eyes actually cannot see them. And actually, that you, so, so that's why whenever you see that, oh, the attacker only need to manipulate you know, 0 0.002% of the signals, you can change change the, um, uh, the, 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 the outcome of the classification, surprising, yes? But, but those, are, those are signals that human eyes could not see. For example, human eyes see these two pictures as the same, but the deep learning algorithm has, would misclassify, which also, means you, uh, which also means that the deep learning algorithm, the model, is actually not looking at the most, most important features of the image. So that's another shortcoming of uh, deep learning that people don't, un don't know what it does until, until the attack, until there's some attacks would, would, would demonstrate that they are looking, looking at the, the wrong thing. But anyway, that's something that we're gonna get to that uh, uh, again a little bit. But to defeat such kind of attack, you know, one observation I have is that we should ignore what the human ignores. Meaning that, hey, look, if there are certain signals that are in such high frequency uh, 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 part of, of the spectrum that human eyes cannot see, we should exclude them. Okay, because what happened is that your machine learning based model is supposed to automate or, um, or do the work on behalf of the human. So if something that to human, it doesn't make sense or human would ignore, your model should also ignore. Okay, because the, like I said, the machine learning model is supposed to replace a human, not to look at things that we, we, we don't care. Okay, you should only care about things that we care. So, so, so in this case, since the manipulations is on signals that human eyes could not see, if you compress them away, your model will work just as well as human. Okay, so this tells you that, you know, one thing to, to deal with these kind of attack is to make sure that we actually process our data so that actually it reflects, it reflects the domain that we are on, right? We use domain, our domain knowledge to control what data should be used, okay? So to summarize the bad, you know, essentially I would say that machine learning has enlarged the attack surface. The attacker can automate the attacks, right? And uh, and we just, you know, I, I think current state of machine learning, including deep learning, is that we cannot simply trust trust it automatically. In particular, for you know, uh, uh, critical applications such as security. So what do we do, right? So this ugly part is nothing, nothing easy here, right? So for example, here's a typical feedback loop that you would see, right? You know, I mean, from attacker's point of view, whenever they see a model, they will analyze the model and then come up with a with attack to, to, defeat, to defeat the attack. And, and we as analysts, we just analyze the attack and then develop some countermeasure, right? And let's say change some examples based on an attack. So that's a kind of a, excuse me. So basically, so this is a loop of, uh, of patching. Right, basically, we define model, we see the attack, we got defeated. Okay, then we're going to patch it. Now, I mean, what I what I uh, what I'm what I try to advocate is that we should flip that and think about you know from a defender's point of view, right? Again, this is a, a still loop. Whenever the point is that whenever we def deploy model, we should already think think ahead what attacks you know would what attacks would do to our model, right? So you can base on some shortcomings of our model or some known, known problems that we already know. So you basically, you know, try to use that to keep modifying your, your model. And then whenever you see there's some attacks, you analyze the model. And again, of course, you, um, you base on the attack, you create modified version of the attacks to change your model. Okay, so, so that's a, you know, you can say that's essentially the same feedback loop except that from a defender's point of view, we should also be proactively looking at possible ways that attacker could defeat our model and then, and then create uh, you know, uh, uh, artificial uh, samples to chain and improve our model, right? Rather than waiting for, the, uh, for our models to be defeated and then react, right? So it's, the point is that instead of reacting, we should be more proactive. Now, um, some, other, some, other, some other issues that are actually pretty important and we, we need to start to really be serious uh, uh, at the, um, uh, serious about um, addressing them, right? Like I said several times that we should really incorporate domain knowledge, right? Like I said, if we, if we process data using our application context, 
we can actually filter out some data that you know essentially uh, may create um, some artifacts that would mislead the machine learning, learning algorithm and also include uh, and also uh, enable attackers to attack our model, such as the a stop sign image that I mentioned, right? Meaning that because we include some high frequency signals that human eyes do not. see, you know, that actually creates a problem. In a sense, you know, you know, by restricting our data to, to what the application context uh, uh, would, would need, you are essentially um, controlling the attack surface, so, that, uh, so to speak. You don't just open up everything for the attacker to manipulate. And then you also, of course, always, always include adversarial examples. So this is more, more, more on the pro proactive side to actually test uh, and find out one of the uh, weaknesses of your model. And then of course, you try to, um, you know, again, you can restrict the attack surface by, by including some, you know, operational constraint. And so that you, you, I mean, I'm sure that you guys had experience when you write a paper, you always talk about, hey, here are ways the attacker may be able to evade my model, but doing so would be, would be costly to them. For example, in order to evade this model, instead of doing one step of the attack, they have to like do 10 steps. So that actually is, you know, essentially you can make an argument that you can raise the bar, okay. And uh, and I just I just want to uh, emphasize the point that I just don't believe that we should use machine learning as a pure black box, okay. Which means that we should not think about, hey, machine learning, awesome, it's everything automated. I don't even need to worry about feature engineering. I just throw it at the data. Whatever comes out, I'm going to use it. That's the wrong attitude. And the time and again, we have shown that the attacker can actually, you know, abuse the machine learning model in multiple ways. And we should really, you know, be smarter about incorporating our domain knowledge and make attack much harder to succeed. Okay. So, so that's why I need to bring human in the loop, you know, uh, you know, to guide the, guide the learning process and also, you know, um, uh, inspect some of the model before we deploy them and so on. And, you know, really at the end of the day, humans should be the, the final decision maker. Okay, uh, I just don't believe that in cybersecurity, everything should be completely automated from end to end. And uh, now in order for human to be involved and be effective, the model has to be what we call explainable. And that's actually a, a, a continue to be a huge challenge. And uh, here an example of if you don't have explainable model, uh, you know, we, we may be using the wrong model uh, without even knowing the model actually does not work. For example, this is a classic uh, story of a clever Hans the horse. Suppose if you say uh, Hans, what's two plus three? And the horse would tap one, two, three, four, five. People say, wow, this horse is genius. But later on, a psychologist find out that actually the horse did not learn how to count. He learned how to actually So let's say you say, hey Hans, what's one plus four? You know, Hans would, would tap one, two, three, four, five, and then the people's faces will light up. Then he knows that's when he should stop. And that's all it is. He does not know how to count, but you know, he learned how to actually look at people's face faces and then react. So it's essentially it's using the wrong model. It doesn't, I mean, so, so which, which means that if you give, uh, 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 how to put it, if, it is, if you put a straight face and say, Hans, what's two plus three? It was keep counting, keep tapping if you don't show any emotion. So that's one way to actually, I mean, that it, it took a long time, surprisingly, it took a long time for people to realize that the model was wrong, okay? And we don't want to repeat that. Now, coming back to reality of what we do, Actually, it's pretty, pretty not straightforward. For example, you know, one of these uh, uh, model that we uh, tool that we use for explain, explanation across sharp, right? So I mean, actually, it works pretty well on some of the image data. Like for example, you know, it will explain to you why it classified this is uh, a meerkat because hey, look, at least it didn't pick, didn't use the you know a background vegetation. It actually highlights the 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 the, the part of the, the image that you know are important. Uh, for me, a cat, and then it, it's, it will not say it's a uh, um, mongoose because it doesn't, you know, match. It, it doesn't highlight uh, highlight some of these uh, areas that actually uh, does not uh, make sense. Okay, 
So, so when, I, when we apply to image view, say, okay, yeah, Shara is doing a good job. But what, what if you try the same kind of tool to our security data? Suppose we have, you know, using deep learning, right? We use uh, malware and basic blocks, uh, you know, as, as, as input data to chain, classifier uh, to classify uh, uh, malware. So, so how do we know that this, you know, what, so, so let's say the, the model say this is ransomware, this is spyware, okay? But if you look at the explanation, can you actually understand why this should be ransomware and this should be spyware, right? So what it needs at least, the next level is that try to explain contextual information about the model output. You know, basically you reason, reason almost like you have yet another level of reasoning of the model's output in order for us to gain some insights of why this is now uh, ransomware, why this is spyware. Just to summarize, the current model, current explanation model doesn't really, really provide us any semantic information about what's being learned. And that's actually a huge shortcoming. I, you know, pre presents a lot of challenges, right? In, in particular, we have to be, the, the ML machine learning algorithm has to be explainable uh, so that people actually can, you know, understand what it does. And also uh, if they need to investigate, they know what to investigate, right? And then uh, on the other hand, we also know that, you know, malware will actually continue to use machine learning and, uh, and, and uh, essentially you can think about the future of uh, cyber warfare would be uh, uh, between attacker and a defender using machine learning to become a very fast paced game. Uh, but the thing is that if there's no human input, I'm just afraid that, you know, then we, 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 we may head to disaster without even knowing or having no control. So what we need to do is having, you know, be able to design some mechanisms to, oh, sorry, to uh, to play a smarter game, right? To basically slow down the, the attack. And uh, yeah, so to summarize, you know, we know that machine learning is great. Uh, it has brought a lot of benefits to security, but on the other hand, the adversary can also take advantage of uh, machine learning to make the attack much more potent. And, uh, and, and the, the challenge I had is that we need to, um, because it, the, the cyber warfare will become much more machine learning and uh, ML driven, uh, uh, machine learning and AI driven, we need to resist um, the temptation of just let everything be automated. We need the ML to be explainable and then we need to get involved uh, as human. Okay, so that's all I have. Yep, thank you. Thank you, Vinti. Um, yep. Now let's open the floor for questions. Um, attendees, please. Uh, so Cal, can, can the attendees uh, use their microphone? They can make it that way or they can raise their hand using the raise hand button down here. We can also use the Q&A. There is a, a Q&A channel down here if you guys want to start posting questions in there. All of these are wonderful options, whatever you would like to do. Um, okay, I think uh, Anish just raised our hand. So we have to let... So, uh... Let me take a look. I mean, how do I look at the, um, how, do I, how do I look at the, oh, let me see, maybe I should uh, Okay, stop I should be able to unmute him. Give me one second. Yeah, there maybe, you go, Anish, yeah, you should be able to. Speak up. Yeah. 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 Yes, I was able to unmute. Thank you, uh, thank you for, um, for a wonderful talk. Yep. Uh, perspective. And, thank you. Yeah, broad and deep, yeah. So, you know, I, one of the things which one finds, especially for security, is the challenge of accessing, you know, relevant data, sufficient data. Mm -hmm. uh, so, have you? How do you go about that? What are you doing to even find ways in which you would reduce your need for data? Any thoughts there? Yeah, that's a great question, right? So, I think it depends on the kind of security work that you want to do. Um, so for example, if you want to uh, do anything uh, with malware, there's a lot of uh, places that you can get malware. Uh, some academic institutions, uh, some of the, um, even some of the 
services online, let's say you can go to Vice Total and ask them for data. They may be able to share enough a sample for you to start your, your work. And if you are interested in uh, other areas, such as let's say you want, suppose you want to do uh, software, software vulnerability analysis, and there's a lot of, uh, uh, interestingly, there's a lot of um, uh, data sets out there, including NIST has a data set. Uh, and then also the people also use GitHub and so on. I mean, I think you're right. I mean, it would, it would be nice to have a standard data set uh, out there that people can use in particular for network data. Uh, that has been continuously to be a challenge uh, when people uh, worry about uh, privacy concern and, and so on and so forth, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't have a great um, uh, answer to that. But I, I, on the other hand, I think normally we reach out to our colleagues uh, if it's, let's say, if you read a paper that look interesting, if you reach out to the colleagues, sometimes you may be able to get not only the tools, but also the data set that they use. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, but you, you haven't found the need for synthetically generating data. It's really, uh, data is somehow made available from these existing, uh, existing attacks. These yeah, existing that's a great databases. question. Yeah, great question, yeah. Right, right. So great question. I suppose you want to do vulnerability discovery of, uh, let's say Linux. In that case, you don't need the uh, data, right? You just basically hack it, you know, whatever. Now, suppose you say, I want to create a model, deep learning based model to detect um, PDF malware. So in that case, you know, my students would actually collect, you know, I think there are a lot of ways that you can collect some PDF uh, documents. Uh, and then also you can then, uh, then you, you probably have to, uh, to hand code uh, some of these uh, well-known attacks to create a PDF malware. And they also, every now and then, there's some sample of uh, malware that out there that you can, you can use. Now, I always tell students that, you know, the ideal sort of uh, experiment will be that you have both the synthetic data and also the real data, right? The synthetic data would be designed to actually test all the features that you, that you want to uh, show in your, in your paper, right? And then the, re the real data will say, hey, look, there's some real realistic examples out there. So ideally, ideally you won't have both. Yeah. Okay. Um, Daniel Watkins and Theodore Allen both have questions. Daniel was first and is currently unmuted. He would like to know um, who is a proponent of using no human involvement for AI slash ML? Are there advantages to that? I'm sorry, can you read that question again? I can speak if you'd like. Uh, I was curious to know yeah, if, if, okay, yeah, sure. who is a proponent of not using human involvement for AI or ML? And is it just laziness that you said we need to resist the temptation to you know, not be involved as a human or are there actual advantages to you know, not having a human involved? So, yeah, I mean, so temptation, okay, maybe temptation is the, the wrong word. But I, I recently contacted uh, some of my uh, former uh, students and so on. They 